I love the sound of the mandolin. That tremolo. Didn't used to like it. Matter of fact, I remember, uh, oh, about 30 years ago, just after Zet and I had been together for a couple of years, and her parents were just resigning themselves to the fact they had this long-haired hippie musician as a son-in-law. <laughs> uh, her mom, Grandma Bear, was uh, cleaning out a closet and came across this old mandolin, and she offered it to me. And I was a rock and roll musician all full of myself, and trying to make my name as a rock and roll musician, mandolin, I want a mandolin. So no thanks. And besides, uh, tuning heads are, you know, they're old and kind of crooked, hard to tune. And, uh, uh, what I didn't want to admit is that I just didn't know how to play it. That, 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 that two sets of four strings are hard to tune, and uh, they sound great when they're in tune and sound awful when they're not. And so, anyway, I passed on that mandolin. Didn't think any more about it. And then um, three years ago, Zet's mom passed away. And as we were going through her things, uh, this mandolin resurfaced. And uh, being the musician in the family, it was kind of gifted to me. And this time I received it in a different spirit, particularly because as we were also going through the other things in the closet, we saw stuff that Grandma had never talked about, mostly her life on the farm. And we got to understanding why she never talked about it, because she had lived through the worst of the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression out on the western prairie. A very hard time. She liked to talk about her mom having come on a covered wagon and having homesteaded the land and having uh, busted the sod on 320 acres by hand with a horse-drawn plow. But she didn't talk about herself in her own life. She just didn't, didn't want to go there. And... Um, once I made friends with this mandolin, I haven't really learned how to play it well, but once I made friends with it, I um, learned, I wrote this little song. I asked Hank to play it with me. We're going into the studio tomorrow, tomorrow to record it. Because I just love the way it sounds when Hank plays. Grandma's mandolin sits in the closet Where it's been for more than 60 years and The last time that she played it Was the day she left the farm and Left behind her many young girls' tears Born and raised out on the western prairie Which stretched out flat as far as she could see where her only real companion was a shadow Standing where she didn't care to be But the nearest town was 15 miles on horseback And God knows that that round trip took so long That mostly she just stayed up in the attic And played her lonely farm girl song Cause music always seemed to make things better And let her dreams fly far and wide again and Getting off the farm was never easy Except when Grandma played her mandolin Brother died when she was younger, and hunger gripped 
the family by the throat Her mama and her daddy became like strangers As they worked both day and night to stay afloat And then one day a strong wind started blowing And just kept blowing harder all the time Till a heavy coat of dust covered everything in sight While the howling winds kept prowling through their minds But music always seemed to make things better And let her dreams fly far and wide again Getting off the farm was never easy Except when Grandma played her mandolin Escaping through the magic of the music Which only ears of corn could ever hear But the way that she felt singing And that mandolin a-ringing Could break right through the blues and dust bowl fears Because music always seemed to make things better And let her dreams fly far and wide again Getting off the farm was never easy Except when Grandma played her mandolin I love that about music. That music helps take you far and high away. And each one of us has a farm we like to get away from. It might look more like a desk job that's 9 to 5, okay, more than like 9 to 6.30. Or maybe you'd like to get away from the dishes in the kitchen sink or the pile of kids' clothes to be washed again, dirty diapers to be changed again. And then there's part of us that just wants to escape and just, just be away from that. But music, music is one of those gifts of life that helps us be with what is. At the same time, it helps us escape, helps us be here um, with whatever the circumstances are in our lives. It's the reason why prison chain gang sang and why cotton pickers sang in the fields and why sailors on those long trips across the ocean saying. And we as a people, just in very recent years, in less than 50 years, we have lost the gift of singing communally, by and large. And in elementary schools today, there's nobody singing about old Aunt Rudy and her <laughs> goose is dead, or even old McDonald's that don't have time for that. The curriculum requires that the essential elements be taught from the time kids are three years old and who's got time to sing. And besides, who needs to sing? All you have to do is turn on the internet, the iPhone, the cell phone, the iPad, the music, and music comes at you. But there's something different about music that comes at you from music that comes from you, through you. And that's one of the reasons um, I love to gather here on Sunday morning. It's one of the reasons why music is an integral part of what we do, and particularly music that people sing along to and clap their hands to. There's something that happens. Kiko, would you give me a riff, just please, Professor? And even if a couple of seconds ago you were tuning out because that guy was just talking blah, 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 <laughs> The drum goes and suddenly suddenly, I don't know, your toes and your fingers and your soul are involved. And we as a people have always known that there were always campfires with drummers. And if from the furthest northern Inuits and in the Arctic to the hottest places in the Kalahari Desert, there were people beating on logs and skins and cans. And, and, I, 
and look at their hands just making a rhythm. And we've forgotten that as a culture. And I think, I think, I don't know, it's just one of my theories, I think that's part of the reason why so many people feel diseased in our lives. We've gotten disconnected from the rhythm of our lives, from the songs of our forefathers, our grandmothers and grandparents and great, 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 great grandparents. And no, and yes, I know with a click of a of, of a mouse, there's tens of millions of songs instantly available to us. But that's that's different from a song that's sung and felt, a song that has simmered in your bones since you were born. And and the way that's different for me, in addition to the beat, is. When melody fires up, and whether it's a primitive chant sung by a shaman around the campfire or an aria sung by a mezzo-soprano in the most glamorous of stage settings, there's something that happens to our brain. Are the neurons in our brains fire differently in the presence of music than they do in the presence of prose? and certainly in the presence of the sound of cars driving by, the sound of electricity humming in the walls, which, by the way, for most of you who don't know, the predominant sound in your life and mine is the low background hum, which we don't register right in our ears, but is very much present in every room where electricity is running. That, that the electrical currents running through these buildings resonate at a particular frequency. And we hear it, we feel it. And I believe, at some level, it is disrupting the rhythm of our lives, of our hearts, of our souls. And that's not good or bad, it just is. And it requires active intervention from Music Man. <laughs> Part of the reason I've made it my life mission to keep kumbaya moments coming. It's what I do. You know? I don't understand what's so funny about peace, love, and understanding and singing in harmony. When did that become out of fashion and ridiculous? And yet, as recently as 20 years ago, I, was, I had a contract with Region 20 and was singing in lots of schools, about 100 schools a year for three years in a row. And this was in the late 80s, early 90s. It was a wonderful work, it was miserable work to be stuck in the cafeteria with 300 kids here, entertain them. <laughs> Being the kind of guy I am, that's what I did hundreds of times. And I did pretty well because I wouldn't stop until I had everybody in the room singing with me. It's gotten infinitely harder in the, in the 20 years since then to get children to sing along because they don't, they don't understand what sing along means. Sing along, what does that mean? <laughs> they've, they've lost it. We've lost it in our culture, the understanding that it's important to have songs in common. Again, I'm not here to complain. I'm not, I am here to explain why it is it's really important for as many of us as dare to sing along, to sing along whenever there is an opportunity that presents itself. And to understand that what we're doing here on Sunday morning as we sing and as we chant and as we turn inwards, whether it's the sound of the bluegrass band or the didgeridoo player or the Native American medicine woman who was here last week or the cool Mexican-American rapper who's going to be here next week, or the funk uh, band that's going to play in a few weeks. Whatever the style of music, the invitation to sink into the rhythm and to sing along is not just a good idea, it's not just polite to keep the vibe going in the circle, but it's essential, I believe, to the health of a fully lived life. Now, obviously, I'm prejudiced on the subject. But I'd like to talk very briefly here for just a minute about the notion that music invites me to be fully present, to really hear the music, the rhythm, the melody in my bones, 
in my muscles as well as in my heart and mind. And it also invites me to open up and feel life from a wider perspective, to recognize that when I'm singing in harmony with the person behind me, ideally I'm hearing the other person too. And, and, and any choir director worth her salt knows to tell the choir members to sing, to find that volume to sing at in which they hear themselves equally with the people around them. And those of you who've had the pleasure of singing in the choir or playing in a band that really jam and well know what, how delicious it is to surf on that wave that is shimmering right at that point where you hear your own instrument, your own voice, just as well as you hear everything else and it melds into one delicious ocean of sound. Yeah, and that's available to us all. And, and in that, in melting into that ocean of sound, we're also invited to stretch beyond this moment and feel ourselves connected to all humans who have ever sing, who have ever sung, who have ever danced, who have ever chanted, who have ever remembered for a moment that it's okay to get up off the farm and fly high and far and wide again. There's an old Sufi folk tale about a man named Ahmed who was falsely accused of a crime and imprisoned for it. He was despairing and the next day one of his friends came to visit him in jail to console him. And Ahmed said, forget about consolation, get me out of here. <laughs> I, I've got to get out of here so I can prove my innocence. And the friend said, well, I'll see what I can do. So Ahmed was very pleased a couple of days later when his jailer gave him a big package and said, this is from your friend. And, and Ahmed unrolled it hoping to find, you know, a saw, hacksaw or a file or something to pick the lock of his cell with. He was disappointed to find that it was just a prayer rug. Prayer rug. I asked to get out of here. What's he giving me a prayer rug for? But he, well, it was a prayer rug and the rest of it was a bare cell. He had nothing else to do. So he sat down to pray on his prayer rug. And as he knelt down to pray and bowed his head, he noticed there was something odd about the pattern in the carpet. And right there at that point, at that point where his head was meant to touch the prayer rug, right there at the point of the Qibla, he noticed that it was an unusual pattern and it looked a lot like the lock on his prison door. And he studied the pattern further and realized it was a diagram of the lock and instructions on how to pick it. And he used those instructions to escape the cell and prove his freedom and innocence. I think music invites us just like Ahmed's prayer rug did. Music invites us to look again at our surroundings, to feel again that we're free to escape and also to be fully in our surroundings. At least, that's my story. That's my song, and I'm sticking to it.